Hello and welcome full sailors. So excited to see so many of you taking advantage of this great Hall of Fame session. My name is Katrina Green and I'm part of your alumni relations team. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. I'm seeing a lot of people use their names. Please be sure to use your full name. We are taking attendance for any classes or GPS points that you're hoping to receive today. Also, be sure to use the chat. We'd love for you guys to network with each other. Just remember to keep it professional and on topic. And if you have any questions for Erin as she's going through the presentation, be sure to type them in the Q&A section. We'll try to address the ones that are relevant for each section as we go, and then we'll have additional Q&A at the end. Now let's introduce this stellar lady that you are all here to see and learn from. She's not only a 2010 Game Design Master's graduate, she also carries the distinction of being the first female graduate from the Full Sail Game Design Master's at Full Sail. She has over a decade of experience in leading teams and production for entertainment industry giants, as well as the top names in gaming. Her list of credits and companies include Walt Disney Parks and Resorts Online and PlayStation Now. Currently, she is the lead project manager of eSports for Blizzard Entertainment, leading the teams behind the global eSports events for Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, and StarCraft II. It is my honor to introduce you to Full Cell, Hall of Fame 11 inductee, and our first lady of gaming, Miss Erin Everhart. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be back doing these. Uh, I have missed everybody like crazy down on campus. I wish that we could be doing this in person. But uh, we are not, so here we are uh, in fabulous Zoom. Uh, and uh, yeah, today I've got, uh, I wanted to kind of sit down and I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to talk about. And so they, they kind of approached everybody and said, okay, you can kind of come in and teach whatever you'd like, uh, you know, whatever kind of topic is really exciting for you. Um, and, and so I chose a topic uh, for today that is something that is very near and dear to my heart um, and is probably gonna sound a little nerdy. And as I say it to, to, uh, out loud, I feel a little, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, funny, but I love project planning. Um, I love uh, the initial process of breaking down projects. And I think that, um, you know, over the course of my career, I've had a lot of different kinds of projects that have really inspired me and have allowed me to sort of hone my process over the, uh, the last decade of my career. So, um, you know, a little bit about me uh, sort of before we get started and why I like this so much. Um, so I uh, graduated from Full sale, uh, I guess 11 years ago now, time does fly. Uh, and uh, when I graduated, uh, I, or at least when I started school, I had no idea what a project manager was. Um, I had never encountered one. I had never worked with one professionally. Uh, I didn't even really know what they did, especially not on games and technology uh, projects. And so coming into admissions, I was coming in completely from scratch. I had no idea what the production track was going to be like. Um, I didn't really quite even know what to expect. And as it turns out, uh, it's something that totally lights up all of the parts of my brain that make me really excited to go to work and to work on really tough problems. Um, so I basically professionally get to break down really tough, big things into little bite-sized chunks and that helps us kind of understand the scope of the problem and what we're trying to accomplish. And so um, throughout the time uh, across my career, I started in a small indie studio uh, working on uh, client games. And so we were making properties uh, for companies and, and clients like Giant Microbes, uh, Pepper's Ghost Productions, uh, which was a British uh, TV company uh, that allowed us to work on one of the first big titles I ever worked on, uh, which is a browser-based kids game called My Tiny Planets. And so I got to see the experience of working with clients. I got to see the experience of working with education educational children's titles uh, at that company. Um, after that, I went to Disney uh, and there I got my first taste in truly global, massive, touches millions of people every day kinds of projects. Um, these were things like WaltDisneyWorld.com, which as you can imagine, uh, gets a lot of people coming in to traffic every day, uh, trying to buy their park tickets, trying to get park maps, trying to understand um, how to navigate uh, the then brand new Magic Band system that they still use in the parks today. Uh, one of really cool technology that uh, I think has really transformed the, the tourist experience at the park. Uh, very excited for it to be coming to Disneyland, uh, where I live here in California. So looking forward to that. 
Um, but I worked on that project when it was brand new. Uh, we also worked on other global properties like their travel company, Adventures by Disney. Um, I was there when we launched the uh, Alani Resort down in, in Hawaii uh, for Disney. And so I got to see a lot of really interesting massive global projects that not only touch a lot of different departments internally, but also were touching millions of customers around the world um, in different circumstances. And so um, that was kind of my first dip, dip my toes into to, to really large uh, full scale projects. After that, I went to PlayStation and I had a couple of different uh, really fun experiences at, uh, during my time at Sony. So when I joined the company, I came in um, at, right at the start of the acquisition of the studio Gaikai, uh, which was then doing their own independent thing. They were looking for, um, for, for investors and for purchasers uh, for their technology that allows you to stream games uh, around the world. Uh, and just as you would with your music or your movies. Um, and that technology was really, really inspiring to me. Uh, I still think that uh, that is going to be the future, I, I, I think, uh, as our infrastructure gets better. Um, but uh, I'd like to say that that is kind of, you know, one of the really most challenging technical projects that I've ever worked on before. So I got a little bit of taste of the high tech, um, really kind of nuts and bolts, how are we launching this thing for commercial audiences there. Um, but also at the same time, we were also transitioning uh, this little startup studio, Gaikai, and transitioning it into being a worldwide studio as part of the PlayStation family. And so that is working with the PlayStation, uh, other teams in different cities, uh, trying to understand their processes, trying to understand how they approach projects and how they communicate. And so we were kind of uh, putting the track down in front of the train, so to speak, as we were driving full speed. And so um, that was kind of my first foray into really understanding stakeholder management at a key level, um, understanding how to uh, globally launch with a variety of different technical pieces and different technical teams located around the world. Um, we also launched the PlayStation 4 during that time. So it was an extremely pivotal moment in my career in terms of the kinds of scale uh, and scope of projects that I was working on. And then as most recently, um, I just hit my three year anniversary at Blizzard and uh, Blizzard has been kind of my dream company. I've always wanted to work there. And um, and so I uh, am not working on uh, specifically technical things at PlayStation or at, at Blizzard. I am working on live events. Uh, I am an esports project manager there. And so uh, the projects that I work on now are very different. Um, they look like, um, well, right now they're not live events, but uh, prior to the pandemic, they were live events. Um, they're very global in nature as well. Uh, we're talking about players that could be coming in from China or Korea or Poland or Mexico. Um, a variety of different languages spoken, um, all kind of melting into this really huge global community. And so um, really having an understanding of how live events work and, and what kinds of project planning that goes into that um, has been really interesting. So I have been really fortunate that I have been able to work on a huge number of different kinds of projects. And I would say that um, across the scale um, and the sort of types of things that I've seen, um, I would say that there are some kind of universal truths uh, at least in the way that I approach project management. Um, so I see uh, similar building blocks uh, between projects, no matter how different they might seem uh, to one another. Um, we have we have to set goals, we have stakeholders to manage, we have risks to uh, account for, uh, we have budgets to keep. And so um, as a project manager or really as any kind of discipline across any industry, uh, these same principles will be very useful for you. So the approach I wanted to take, to take today was to give you a very, very practical approach to how I kick off a project. Um, I'm going to be showing you some examples of templates that I've created in the past. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the kinds of things that I really like to create and I see as kind of fundamental project documents that I like to keep. Um, and uh, this is all done on free software. So you don't need anything fancy. You don't need Microsoft Project. You don't need uh, Trello. You don't need Jira. You don't need Atlassian. Um, to get started, all you need, uh, at least in my opinion, is Google Docs, uh, which will come uh, as part of your Google account. So um, as part of Google, uh, the Google Suite, you will have documentation that 
you can create, you have spreadsheets, you have PowerPoint presentations, you have surveys, you have forms. Um, so it has a lot of power built into uh, this really awesome toolkit. And this is, uh, in fact, we use Google Suite uh, at work at Blizzard. And so a lot of the project planning uh, templates that I show you today are literally things that I use to help kick off and start brainstorming and start discussions with my own team every single day. So this is meant to be super practical. Um, anybody can take it and start to use it. Um, and uh, as Katrina mentioned, uh, as we're going, please feel free to chime in with questions as you have them. Um, and then we'll do some QA, Q and A at the end. Um, but yeah, this is meant to be interactive. So ask them if you got them. So for me, um, project management is really a mindset. Um, it is being curious. It is prioritizing communication. It is problem solving. All of these pieces all rolled into one discipline. Um, I think more than any other person on the team, your project manager or your producer is going to be the person that is trying to head off problems before they even become a reality. And so a lot of times this is being very creative in the way that you approach project breakdowns. Um, Depending on how big they are or how small they are, you may have a lot of stakeholders or you may only have a couple. You may have a really big global team that you're working to all rally behind a single unified goal, or you might just be you working on something um, either as your own personal project or something that you are contributing as part of a larger project uh, at hand. And so um, a lot of the ways that I look at things and look at projects, um, it's all universal. Doesn't matter if you're just by yourself or if you have a big team. So today um, we are going to kind of start to, to kind of start with um, <laughs> the kind of process and the way that I kick off um, projects. And uh, the way that I see uh, sort of project management, or at least to kick off um, in a sort of most fundamental way, is taking something really, really big and making it into little tiny bite-sized chunks. So why is this useful? Um, so first of all, studies have shown that a uh, method of breaking down complex tasks into bite-sized chunks actually works. Um, it works with your productivity. It kind of like a little bit of a brain hack um, in some ways. And so your brain has very limited bandwidth. Um, the, I think the average person can hold like three to five items in their head at any given time. Um, I like to refer to it as my RAM. Uh, it's my active, like what am I thinking about right now? And so once you get past three, three to five things, uh, your brain starts to filter out details. It starts to filter out uh, important dates. It starts to filter out numbers and things like that. And so um, it becomes very tough to hold all of this stuff in your head. It doesn't matter if you are planning a garden project or if you are planning a global release of a new game, uh, your brain has limited capacity. So breaking things down into little bite-sized chunks makes that easier. Um, the next thing is that it actually makes you more efficient. Uh, you don't have to think about next steps constantly. You have spent the time ahead of a project thinking about all of the different components that could come into play, all of the potential uh-ohs or oh crap moments that could potentially happen, and you've already put some thought into that. So if that does happen, you don't have to shift gears. You don't have to spend um, anxiety or, or time to help pivot. You've already pre-thought about those things. And so it kind of gives your brain a little bit of a mental, uh, sort of a mental breather a bit, knowing that uh, it's likely that you have thought about this before it even comes to pass. So it makes you more efficient. Um, and then finally, it, it feels good. Um, crossing off things off of your to-do list um, actually releases dopamine, uh, which is the uh, hormones that are responsible for pleasure and motivation. And so as you check something off your you know, to-do list for the day, smaller bites equals even more mental rewards. And those mental rewards can actually pay huge dividends, um, you know, in times where you're feeling a little bit burned out or you're feeling overwhelmed, feeling like, oh my gosh, there's no way I could get this whole thing done. Um, some people refer to it as, as eating, eating the elephant, uh, where you have to take just one little tiny bite size at a bite, right? You can't eat the entire thing all in one sitting. You just take it little bites at a time, right? And uh, while it's a little bit of a strange uh, <laughs> a strange way to, to look at it. It is very true. Um, it takes something that feels very insurmountable, something that feels very tough and, 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 and heavy and breaks it into like, oh, I just need to do this. Yes, of course. I can I can write a, you know, a to-do list. Like that's I can do that. That's pretty easy. And then once you get started, uh, you realize that all of those little bite-sized things equal 
the big project. So in summary, uh, it just feels good. It feels good to do this this kind of practice, and uh, I think I think the term for it is micro productivity. Uh, and so, you know, I don't I don't use that term, but that's just kind of how I think about it. So, so there are those benefits. Um, also, from a team standpoint, um, this method of breaking down projects and things into smaller sizes is hugely beneficial for your team. Um, thinking about things in the larger scale let's say that you have three offices worth of folks that are all contributing code or design or art uh, or sound to your project um, if you are not all on the same page and do not have a lots of little micro checkpoints in there, there is a very good chance that you are getting off track without even knowing it. Um, someone's interpretation of something that you said, uh, they might be going with that assumption and you come back a month later not having checked in with them, they feel great. Ah, yeah, I got exactly what you were looking for done. It's all done here. I think you're going to be really, really happy with what we've come up with. And they show you and they're super proud and you realize it has absolutely nothing to do with what you were originally asking for. And so breaking things down into more bite sized um, bites allows you to have more frequent check ins and allows you to course correct and iterate on things as you go. So I can't uh, can't stress it enough. This is a, is is a really good method, and um, and again, you can use this uh, literally for any kind of project. Even if you need to do spring cleaning in your house, you can use this. Uh, something that I myself need to do. Um, anytime I move, I make similar kinds of spreadsheets. Um, so, what exactly are we talking about here? So, we're talking about building blocks, um, and. Uh, there are ways to do this. Uh, you can take this um, from methodologies from places like the Project Management Institute. Um, if you go to get your PMP certification, you're going to be going through and studying a book called the Project Management Body of Knowledge, the PMBOK. Uh, and all this strikes fear into the heart of project managers everywhere. Um, it is a, a very fancy certification that you can get that basically says, I know how to do this. Like I know how to break things down as part of this methodology. So there are official ways that you can do it through that, uh, and you can take a test to prove it. Uh, or there are more casual ways to do it. Um, and I think you you really develop that leadership style. You develop that um, that kind of knack for breaking things down to the right bite sizes um, over time. This is something that I started learning. Um, in 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 my internship when I first started in uh, right out of school. Um, they taught me how to do user stories, and we'll get to user stories in a little bit. Um, but that is a is a part of the Scrum or Agile development process. Uh, that is another way to break bigger things down into smaller bite sized chunks. So no matter how you do it, um, there are a lot of different methodologies out there that allow you to do it. Um, I'm going to show you my own personal way of doing it. Um, that is, this is going to be, again, my own kind of take on things. And so this uh, may not work for everybody. This may not be detailed enough for everybody. This may be too detailed for some people. Um, this may be overkill for some projects and not enough for other projects. And so uh, you will get the feeling of, you know, how 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 important or how uh, integral things are as you progress uh, through this practice. Um, but I'm going to show you the kind of baseline stuff that I do. So when I get started, um, it can be uh, as simple as making a notepad list or a whiteboard diagram. Um, anybody that has worked with me knows that I am famous uh, for taking up an entire day's worth of a conference room with the biggest best whiteboard at work. Uh, we have a couple of conference rooms that just have this wall to wall, 30 foot awesome big beautiful whiteboards that you could just draw all over. And so uh, that is like my favorite method of doing it is I get my stakeholders in a room and we just start taking notes together. Um, and what that ultimately turns into for me are a few different major pieces. So one is your project charter, the what are we doing? Why are we trying to do it? And who is it for? And I'll show you an example of that. Second thing is your project plan. That is a living document. It is your task list. It is your milestone tracker. It's your risks list. It's your open questions list. And I'll show you an example of that. There will be requirements documentation, which could be one document, or it could be a whole series, or it could even be a entire wiki that you build out for your team. Uh, some teams have entire 20, 30 different page tabbed wikis uh, that they build out for their documentation. Um, and so I'll show you an example of that. 
And then the other are, there are kind of other pieces and parts um, like your budget, your timeline, uh, your contracts, things for legal uh, that you'll keep on the side. Um, and uh, I won't go into those uh, as much today, um, but I will touch on the areas that are pretty relevant. Um, so I realize this seems like a lot and well, frankly, it kind of is. Um, as it turns out, <laughs> doing uh, major multi-million dollar projects uh, for big companies is a, it's a lot and it takes a lot of brain power. It takes a lot of time. Um, and so one of the things that I always recommend is start earlier than you think you need. Um, this process, uh, while uh, it, is, it is time consuming and it takes a lot of input and direction from your stakeholders and from your teams, um, it is extremely worthwhile to do this kind of pre-production phase so that you're setting yourself up for success uh, later on. Um, and this also allows you to better collaborate with those team members as they are also giving their input at the time when the project plan was created, which means it's likely that they've signed off on what goes into it, uh, which means they're going to have better buy-in and they're going to feel way better about doing the work that you all agree to rather than the project manager just coming in and kind of wagging their finger and saying, I decided you have to do this, so you better get on it. You know, that doesn't feel good. Um, this is something that is uh, meant to be a collaboration uh, between multiple stakeholders. All right. So how do you get started? Um, the first thing that I do is I uh, is I, I find out everything that I possibly can in the background of a project. So I'm going to give us some more specific examples later on. Um, but you know, you could think about this as um, I'm going to plan a site for the Global Game Jam. What do I need to do um, if you're going to be doing that? Has Global Game Jam been done before? Yes. Why? Yes, it has. Has it been done at full sale before? Yes, it has. Uh, so there are plenty of historical things uh, that you can look at that other people have done before you. Using historical knowledge and learning from others is just a huge way to get a immediate uh, kind of kickstart off of your project um, because there are already pitfalls that people have fallen into and have crawled back out of um, and help, uh, they will help you to kind of navigate in the future. So I like to ask as many questions as I can. If somebody else is giving me a project, let's say our product management team comes in and they say, okay, we need a new engagement feature or we need a new search functionality for this app. Um, we have a huge catalog and nobody can find anything in it, um, which is exactly what happened uh, at PlayStation Now. We had a huge catalog of games on our, on our streaming service. It was very, very hard for people to find in individual titles. So we needed to come up with a search functionality. So no matter um, what it is, whether that's result of data or you have leadership coming in and telling you something, or it's a project you're initiating yourself, um, start with the questioning phase. Ask as many people who have worked on this in the past as you can. If you have a mentor, you can talk through them, uh, talk with them through it, um, and just start to, to kind of get a feel for the scope, the size. Um, what are we actually talking about here? Are we talking about, in the case of Global Game Jam, we're we talking about hosting for 10,000 people, or are we talking about hosting for 100 people? Are we talking about a search functionality on a technology project um, that spans massive multiple libraries? Uh, it needs to have a lot of different filters. Or are we talking about a simple type in a word and get a result? Um, and so you kind of need to start uh, that process. And that is where your project charter comes into play. <clears throat> so I'm going to show my screen here. Um, your project uh, charter is going to be the first starting point. Um, and a lot of times um, what you are asking, we're over here, right? Hold on. Let's make sure I'm on the right screen. Here we go. OK, so your project charter um, is going to be the first phase. And this is where I usually start. Um, and this can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it. So the ones that I have here, the examples that I'm going to show you today are, are a little complex. And uh, in this case, it actually is it works out pretty well because this kind of holds our hand through all of the pieces and parts that we need to collect. Um, so the first thing that we do is we figure out who our project team members are. Um, this could be your franchise lead. This could be a product manager. This could be your live operations manager. These could be technical folks. These could be designers. It is These are the people that you're going to be using on your main everyday 
what are we doing here, people? Um, these are your team leads um, and your sponsors of your project. Uh, and you wanna kind of put those together in one single place. Um, there are many different ways of doing your stakeholder list. Uh, this is one very tiny little uh, example of it, but there are ways to do it um, that are built more out for uh, detailed decision-making. Um, there is something called a RACI chart, R-A-C-I, uh, and that allows you to break down whether or not people just need to be informed, whether they are decision makers, whether or not they have the ability to green light or stop a project, um, and it kind of identifies who the main people are that you're going to be working with. This is a huge step. Do not skip it. You're going to need to know who your resources are. Next thing um, that I start to look at is the project overview. So what are we calling it? Is there an internal name? Is this highly confidential? Do we need to give it a you know funny kind of name? Apollo, Griffin, Endor, whatever it is that we're calling it. Um, sometimes projects will have code names internally. Um, who are your leads? Who are the people at the end of the day? If you need to call somebody about this project, who are you calling? And a lot of times, if you're the project manager, that is gonna be you. Um, proposed timing, you're not always going to have this, especially if you are working in a more agile environment uh, where you are trying to understand, um, you know, iterative process, you may not have a launch date. Uh, in the case of esports, we have we have dates, uh, we need to buy venues to time, we need to allow people to purchase travel tickets to go to those events. Uh, so you set a date ahead of time and you have to meet that date. <laughs> so you put your proposed timing in there. Um, there's budget. If you have a number, you can. Otherwise, you can go back and use this for estimates later. Um, and then a background, a little bit of an elevator pitch. What exactly are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and then we go into these other sections. Um, again, some of the stuff may be relevant for you. Other times it won't be. Um, business needs and benefits. Why are we doing this? Who is our audience? What are we trying to benefit? Who are we trying to benefit? Um, in the case of the source functionality, we're trying to increase, uh, you know, it, you, you, use of the app through the ease of the tools. And so if you can, the theory is if, if you can find what you're looking for, you're going to stay in the application much longer and you are going to use it, uh, which is more value for your customer. Uh, so understanding these pieces and parts. Um, what are your objectives? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, what hard requirements must we hit? Uh, do we need to work with a specific sponsor or a partner? Um, what does success look like? Uh, then you can go into your deliverables, your scope. What exactly is is it that we're we're delivering? So in search functionality, it's narrowing down. Are we doing cross library searches, or are we doing one search within our own owned library? Are we returning metadata? Are we returning any kind of internal data for your system? Um, so you can you go through and you, you scope things out. Um, this is often done with your primary stakeholders, and if it's a technical project with your tech team, things like that. Um, Throughout this entire process, you are leaning on other folks to help you fill this in. You are not doing this all by yourself. <laughs> um, and then uh, some kind of proposed milestones or high level schedule. Um, we also talk about what is out of scope, so what we know we're not doing. Uh, and then we start to get into risk descriptions, high level things that could potentially happen. That is so wonderful, Erin. We have a question already. Mark was asking if it'd be possible to share blank copies of the forms that you're going through. Oh, I can possibly do that. Yeah, let me, uh, let's, let's uh, coordinate on that afterwards, Katrina, because I, I think we could probably do that. Awesome, thank um, you. Yeah, so having templates like this is really, really handy because it basically gives you the roadmap. Here's all the stuff I need to go fill out, go fill it out. Um, they can also look like PowerPoint presentations. This is another version of the project charter uh, that you can do. And as you can see, it's pretty similar stuff. Key dates, proposed tactics, what's our scope, what's our investment. Um, what are our returns that we're looking for? Um, and sometimes having it in presentation style, um, this is like <laughs> not the most glamorous version, um, but you know, having strong presentation of your of your initial charter sometimes helps a lot if you're not greenlit yet and you need to get the green lighting. Uh, sometimes things like this show a little bit better than big you know, weighty documents like this. This is a little bit easier for executives to grok. You kind of boil it down to what they're looking for. Um, and then I also have some other basic kind of process doc, uh, templates and documentation as well. Um, similar stuff you're going to see over here. What are the what are the project roles? Who are their leaders? Who are executing? Um, you know, in the case of process check, checklists, what are the things that you need to be doing? Um, 
common program risks, um, additional documentation, other past research. So you're going to see very, very similar kinds of things here um, that uh, that you're, you know, kind of like a broken record, like you're going to need to know all of these things uh, as you work through the process um, with your team. And so this starts at the very beginning. Um, I usually call a kickoff meeting with my major stakeholders. We sit down in a room and we hash this stuff all out. Um, we have a template. We fill out section by section. And as we're talking, we start to identify holes in the plan or open questions. Uh, and that is where the next uh, start, uh, piece starts to come in. So as, as the team is kind of talking through this project charter, uh, usually I am up at the whiteboard starting to take lists of things that we're talking about, ideas that people are really excited about. Um, problems that they could see coming up. Ooh, you know what? I would love to be able to do this, but actually we've got our technical team already working on this other feature. There's no way that we can get the uh, search feature out before E3 this year. There's just no way. Can we still do our demo at E3 if we don't have this functionality? Um, so you have to kind of ask yourself these questions, understand, um, you know, if something bad were to happen, what are the most likely things that were to be <laughs> that that were to come to pass and how do you to to uh, head them off at the pass. Um, and so all of these kinds of ideas, hopes, fears, open questions, all of these things get organized into um, my personal favorite document, which is my project plan outline. And I will now share that with you guys here. I, Katrina, did we have another question here coming in? We, we do. Mark had an additional question. He wanted yeah. to know if you utilize G-A-N-T-T -T charts to help with scheduling. Yes. So Gantt charts. Um, yes. And, and <clears throat> I think one of the other really nice things about this is that these spreadsheets will easily plug into things like Gantt charts. Um, there are also CSV extensions uh, and imports for JIRA, for Trello, things like that. So as you build your project plan template, um, and that is what this looks like, uh, these can easily be imported into other things. Um, and so this is where I usually start the process in which I would create a Gantt chart out of something like this. So. This is what my project plan looks like. This is a very uh, sort of rough template here, um, but it's got all the normal stuff that you would think about. It's like, what are the activities uh, there? Um, we've got major dates here. If this is a technical project, um, when is your proof of concept date? When do you need to announce? What are your alphas or betas? You could have release candidates. What's your release date, patches, things like that. Um, a lot in technical projects you are iterating and so you're not entirely sure what those dates are going to be you can make best guesses and you can do target time frames but those things kind of iterate over time and you're adjusting um, one thing that i also want to really stress here is that these are living documents you're in here i keep these kinds of these tabs open <laughs> every day with my active projects and just go in and make adjustments as i go oh hey i had a conversation with drew on the social team uh, he said that he no problem we could totally get the social plan rollout as you guys design uh, he's agreed to that. I've gone into my spreadsheet and marked, okay, that guy has given his approval. Um, and so you're constantly in here working. Um, once you get these uh, kind of things set up, like I said, you can import these into other task tracking tools and, and other pieces that are more integral for your project as you do the work. Um, but I find that having something set up ahead of time uh, really helps to cut down on the work there because putting tickets in could be kind of timely, um, uh, time, time, time consuming. Uh, the other thing is, is that a lot of these feature sets and stuff you're going to actually want to give to your engineering teams to break down into bite-sized pieces. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to be, as the project manager, sitting there writing architecture diagrams and talking about architectural backend, you know, updates that need to get made. Usually you lean on your tech teams to help break that down for you, and they have their own process and their own ticketing systems and things like that often, um, their own QA process. And so this is really just... This is the start. This is the free, let's get it written down. And then there's a lot more that comes after this. Um, the other thing that I like to put in here um, are kind of major areas of work. Um, so my risks and blockers, anything that um, we can kind of think about currently, um, risks that could potentially come to the project. So I mentioned, hey, our tech team is already busy. We're not going to be able to get something done. Um, the actual risk here is that uh, you know users may see the product as being 
less than ready for prime time if it doesn't have all the feature sets at the demo that they would expect. And so the risk is, is that you're harming your brand identity. So um, you kind of have to try and think about like, what is the actual impact uh, to either how people see your project or the actual release of it as well. Sometimes those come into play too. Um, and then we also go through in markings as resolved. Um, it's really important to go in and note um, whether or not something like what the mitigation plan is and then who is actually owning it. So um, the other thing that comes with risks is uh, they are usually things that you <laughs> may have thought about ahead of time, but you never like seeing them even when they turn up. So uh, in those cases, <laughs> you want to be sure that you have already kind of pre-thought about who is my person to fix it and what is the fix for it. Um, and then the other thing that I think is probably one of the most important um, areas that I often don't really see done an awful lot is a dedicated area for open questions. Um, there are so many unknowns at the start of a project, um, you know, ranging from, uh, you know, what are our requirements for XYZ disciplines to how the heck are we going to achieve this without software already built for it? Um, you know, there depending on what the actual issue is, and so um, keeping track of all of your questions, small or large, whether it seems important or relevant or not, um, I think is really important. And then just going through and marking when things are accomplished or answered, and then putting that back into your documentation. So um, that's what this uh, kind of turned out to look like. Um, this was a release planning checklist uh, from PlayStation uh, years. I've kind of scrubbed out some of the, the secret, -y, secret stuff. Um, but as you can see there, uh, this is kind of really broken down into pretty granular pieces and parts. So this is a go-to-market checklist. Um, we were also releasing in a new region. So um, this needed to be localized. We needed to have a data center set up and ready to go in that new region. Uh, and we needed to work with the local markets there to make sure that the marketing was correct, the social media was correct, and that the experience was good for non-English speakers, which is what we were sort of starting from as English speakers. Um, so yeah, so there was a website that we needed to do, all of the different things that we needed to do for the website, uh, customer service planning, um, kicking off and explaining to customer service as part of PlayStation, what the heck are we trying to do here? What, are, what is this new feature that we're introducing? Where are areas that we think that people will have struggles with? Um, so creating error dictionaries, writing help pages, um, creating diagrams for how to use different pieces and parts. Um, setting timelines for localization and when things will go live. Um, and then as you can see, we've got the owner over here who is going to be taking care of this. So we farmed out a lot of this stuff to, in this particular case, Zoe and Peter from customer service. They wrote a lot of this stuff. Um, coming into your documentation FAQs, um, FAQs have to go up on the website. People need to understand how something's going to work. They need to be able to go and self-service, um, you know, their help issues. Uh, so we needed to write that stuff. Um, store operations, how to set up the store SKUs, uh, making sure that the flow in which to go in and purchase or download the app is good. Um, Third-party relations, understanding, um, sending letters out to publishers like, hey, here's how the feature works. This is when it's going live. Your game will be featured on the platform on these days. Um, communicating with your third parties. Um, public relations, how is this going to be? Are we going to do an announcement? Are we going to do some kind of big fancy press tour to show off the new technology? Are we doing a demo at E3? Um, so as you can see, um, <laughs> as you start to kind of break down each of these different disciplines, uh, there are a lot of things that start to sort of reveal themselves uh, that you that you, you know, may not think about. Um, and all of these things will break down into your documentation. So whether it's help content or, you know, diagrams of how something's going to work, UX flows, um, all of those are output to this initial list that you've made that helps you break these things down into um, uh, bite-sized pieces that people can then take and work on. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so your documentation will come after this. Um, usually I break up documentation based on the kind of discipline or based on what the feature is. So if we're trying to, um, you know, let's go back to the Global Game Jam site again, um, I would create a Global global Game Jam document. Um, maybe there is a document of documents. Uh, I am also known for doing that where I'll have links to other things depending on what topic you're looking for. So if you want to look at the vendor contract for the venue that you have to get. You want to rent out space in the back of a gaming store to do your global game jam. You need an agreement with that vendor. You need to save the agreement. 
and you need to talk about, you know, what are those requirements? How much space do we need? How many people can be in that space before the fire mar marshal gets upset with you? Um, you know, how are you going to do ticketing at the door and make sure registration is done? Is there space at the front of the store for you to set up a table and check people in as they get there? What about regular store patrons? Can people come in during the Global Game Jam while you're running and buy things in the store? Or does the store have to close down for the day? Um, so all of these things would go into a vendor document. Um, then I would think about, you know, the actual theme on, in running the operations of the event. Is there food in the area? Um, can people very easily, quickly hop next door and get a sandwich if they're hungry throughout the day? Or is it accessible for DoorDash or other delivery services? Um, you, <laughs> People get very hungry <laughs> and kind of grouchy uh, during game jams if they don't have access to like food and snacks and sodas and stuff. So you got to think about all of that stuff. Um, because at the end of the day, um, whether that is a project that you're releasing for other people, or you're putting on an event, um, or you're even doing something for yourself, you will have key uh, target audiences that you're trying to make happy with this. Uh, it is very rare that we're <laughs> making something just for the sake of making it. We are doing it uh, in order to uh, elicit a certain behavior or to provide a benefit or just to get together uh, and, and make games together. So um, so all of these things will break down, um, but it's really important, I just find that uh, to having that fundamental early days uh, breakdown of some of the more complex things and understanding Okay, how are we going to do an announcement of this thing? We are, we are launching in France and Italy uh, and Germany next week. Uh, we need to make sure that all of those uh, announcements have been localized, that we're getting local press there um, in social media, that we're reaching the right channels and that social media is localized. Um, some countries have completely different uh, social media sites. In Russia, the VK is the, uh, the big social media platform there. We don't have that. I don't, I've never used that platform before, but that is how we reach our Russian customers. So uh, it takes a lot of time to to kind of sit in and, and really categorize and, and list everything. Um, but I have just found that it really, really, really helps uh, to, to do that with your team so that a, everybody's bought in. Uh, B, there's a less likelihood that you're going to have forgotten something. And C, uh, you have a better idea of what you're in for. So, um, so yeah. So I will, I will definitely um, see if I can make some of these uh, templates available to you guys. But um, as you can see, they're nothing really all that fancy. They're headers on a spreadsheet. Uh, the effort that comes from this is more so the time and the dedication to sitting down with your stakeholders and picking their brains, asking them lots of questions, poking at whole, you know. Po poking at potential problems, um, looking at different opportunities, doing a ton of research. Uh, and that is, all of those things are why I, I think it's just so, it's my favorite part of a project is, is kicking off. Wow. Wow, I'm in awe uh, just to hear how in-depth, analytical, organizational this all goes. <laughs> and of course you have a decade, over a decade's worth of experience doing this. So it's, it's become second nature and very intuitive to you, but for the students that are in the audience who maybe aren't in the master's program, but like you said, they want to apply this principles to other project management opportunities. What, what kind of first step should they be looking at? Like if, if you wanted to learn under the master project manager or leader, what role should you be looking for to put yourself in alignment to get to that job and to learn from that person? Yeah, so um, like I said, uh, anybody can use this, whether you are one of the artists on the team or you're one of the audio folks on the team or you're on QA or something. Um, everything are just a series of lists, if you think about it like that. You could write it on a notepad. I've got uh, tons and tons of these little sticky notes that are, hey, don't forget to do this. Hey, don't forget to do this. Uh, they're all notes of breaking things down into smaller bites um, You know, for all of the benefits that, that we talked about. But um, I think we all do this natively. I I think it's just putting more structure to it and and kind of creating templates for yourself and creating lists for yourself. So, um, you know, really understanding, especially if you're in a very specific discipline like art or, or audio or something, you have a checklist of things that you care about. Uh, you have, um, you know, you have repeatable steps that you need to do every time in order for an asset to be created or in order for a song to be produced. Uh, and so those are, it's the same practice. It's the same principle. It's writing that out and, and, and kind of breaking it down. Um, the other thing that I recommend is like, you know, one of the most useful pro projects that I learned at Full Sail uh, was in, uh, 
<laughs> oh, this still to this day uh, makes me laugh. Um, Rupert made us break down the and create a project plan for uh, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh, seems pretty straightforward, right? Like you go in, you get your bread, you get your jelly, and this, that, and the other, right? Oh my goodness, he picked that thing apart so badly. We started way too high level, you know. We made way too many assumptions. You assume you have peanut butter. You assume you have forks and knives. You assume you have bread. You assume that jelly has been invented. Um, and so, you know, that you can definitely uh, sort of break it down into like a much more meta, like grow the grapes and make, you know, create the jam and what have you. Uh, you don't typically need to do that. You can kind of write down your assumptions. Um, but you will be surprised at how many steps uh, that you assume get done because it's something that you've done many, many times before. And that's, I think, where a lot of the pitfalls within our projects come is that people assume they know what they're doing. They assume they know what they're being asked to do. And they assume that that person has got enough experience to do it the way that you want it done. And so if you take the assumption out of it and you just have the conversation, uh, it becomes way, way more efficient. Uh, you don't have to go back and revise as much. And it feels like something that you've built together. So, um, you know, if, if you ever need practice, uh, go and write down all the steps to, to building a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, you know, aside from also the logistical side of it, part of it is leading and inspiring your team. Can you talk a little bit about working with different teams that have different mindsets and communication styles and, and how you adapt for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, this is um, kind of the sort of behind the scenes checklist, um, but everybody's got their own personal communication styles that they like. Um, I like to kick off projects. Uh, I like brainstorming uh, sessions. Uh, some of those can be the easiest things in the world to run, depending on the uh, the sort of personality types of your team. Um, but, you know, get everybody together, get pizza, put on some music, sit down talk about what your goals are what are we trying to accomplish and and you know don't be you know be as, as generic as possible so a goal would be you know we want to try and increase engagement on our social media channels so that people know when our live esports event is going to be next month okay so so the goal here is that more eyeballs are on our social media channel the goal here is that uh, people are engaging with and remembering those dates uh, and that there's a clear call to action for them so sit down okay let's get everybody in a room we've got tons and tons and tons of these little notepads i have these sticky notepads all around uh, the place and, and big markers start writing down your ideas what could possibly be cool okay what about a trailer super hype trailer lots of really cool cuts people holding up the trophies okay that sounds really cool trailer that's idea one uh two maybe it's a fun um engagement campaign where um we do a lot of stuff like share your favorite screenshot um of you know in 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 anticipation for this big event, show your character getting ready or, you know, show what your good luck charm is for your favorite team. Um, and people will post up, they've got lucky socks or they've got, you know, their their scarves and stuff that they wear. Um, fan engagement campaigns are really cool like that. Um, there are challenges that you can put out to the community. And so you sit and you just brainstorm, 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 write everything down. Um, sticky note all over the walls and uh, and then you start categorizing those and documenting them. And so again, everything is just making a list uh, and every team is going to have uh, their preferred way of making lists. Um, technical teams oftentimes will start with an architect. Um, they will sit down with the product manager and understand what the scope is, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, they will kind of work directly with the product team um, to sort of understand um, what they're being asked to create and then they will sit down with their team and start to break it down they'll do estimates for how much time they think it'll take they'll do estimates for the kinds of tech that we need do we need to learn a new api for this do we need to introduce a new platform that we didn't have before um, do we need to update some of our existing you know feature sets or software here in areas to be more compatible with what we're trying to do uh, and they will spit back out 
a uh, pretty complex list of things that you would need to do in order for that to happen. Uh, that often com comes with like estimates and time, you know, we think we could have this done by next Christmas. And then that's when the negotiation starts of next Christmas, holy cow, next Christmas, that's gonna take forever. We can't wait that long. Okay, and then now it's the negotiation of, okay, we need to scale back or de-scope some of these things. You're being way, way, way too ambitious. Um, and that is oftentimes how final project will go too, no matter again, what discipline it is. Um, um, a, a lot of times we will kind of go into final projects like really excited, like, oh, what if we build the next like Doom? That would be freaking awesome. We'll have like a million levels and we're gonna have like eight playable characters, 25 different monsters. And then you start to sit down and you break it down. And you're like, wow, this is gonna take us a billion years with only five people, right? And so you have to kind of sit and de-scope, okay. Maybe not 25 playable monsters or 25 monsters. Maybe we start with three monsters and one playable hero. And we get that proof of concept going. And we have one level and we show that really, really awesome. We make sure that looks great. And then, you know, we start there. And so, uh, you know, all professional projects start in the same way. <laughs> um, I want to have an esports tournament on a cruise ship in Dubai. Okay, sounds freaking awesome. Do we know anything about that market? Do we know how much a cruise ship costs to rent? Um, and you start to understand, okay, maybe, not, maybe we don't do cruise ship, <laughs> we do a venue. Um, maybe it's not Dubai, maybe it's Paris. Um, and you start to kind of adjust uh, and, and, and kind of, um, and kind of make adjustments from there. So I think it's it's really an iterative process um, and everybody's got their own personal way that they like to do it. Um, a lot of disciplines like to do it together. Um, but as long as you are being optimistic, you know, you're being <laughs> compassionate to others' needs, you're giving them plenty of time to work on it. Um, people love when you come in at the last minute and say, hey, I need you to do a whole bunch of estimating for me because it needs to be done by tomorrow. Think you can do that? They don't like that. Don't like that at all. So give them time, give them space. <laughs> I love it. You 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 rely on the experts. You let them weigh in, and so they have buy-in. They want to yeah. uh, help. They want to see your project succeed because you've looked at them as the experts and let them weigh in. That's, That's so right. valuable and so important. Yeah, you're glue. You're there to help everybody pull their thoughts together and make sense of it in one kind of place and uh and that's that's kind of how i see you know project management as a, as a methodology is like we help people sort out the cobwebs i guess <laughs> awesome awesome and there's been so many people weighing in in the chat that even though they come from a different degree program this has been so valuable and they really appreciate you taking time to do this i'm sure you guys will access the video once it's available because there were so many sound bites in there to unpack and great words of wisdom what note do you want to leave them with aaron as far as if you Forget everything else. Remember this one thing when you're getting started in project management. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can do it. Uh, you can, like I said, notepads. Um, project management is just, like I said, take a big thing, make it smaller. And um, once you've made it smaller, make it even smaller than that. Um, you know, it, it it really is just as simple as that. And um, once you get more comfortable with with breaking things down and with looking for, you know, potholes that you've seen before in your past and well that's kind of likely to happen uh, it could be could be true that you know maybe our cruise ship is not as reliable because we've had other esports events happen on cruise ships and they had um, a horrible time with trying to get players on players were seasick they didn't feel good they didn't play well on the trip like okay, let's learn from that experience. Let's try and not maybe do a cruise ship then. Um, and, you know, that all comes with time. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be big. You don't need a thousand templates. You don't need a bunch of software. You just need to start breaking things down. And I think that, you know, like I said, it can it can benefit your personal projects as well as uh, anything that you're doing at work. And uh, I will say that uh, if you can get good at this and get good at, you um, communicating the requirements and things. This is a huge, huge, huge asset on a team. Um, a lot of people are not very good at this and especially people who are new in their careers have never had exposure to this. Um, it is it is really awesome if you can kind of if you can kind of learn and pick up some of these skills because it's tough to get people organized. Good help is hard to find and it is it's really tough to find people who um, who have this mindset of, of this kind of let's break it down further. And our very last question of this session, we've got five minutes left. DJ Reyes is asking specifically what advice you would give to those of, of uh, full sailors getting ready to graduate. 
Yep. Um, start making your lists. I got to say, you can project plan your career as well. Um, sit down and, you know, what I did is uh, I, I made a list of all of the studios that I thought would be really cool. Um, I made all of the studios I thought were just working on cool stuff, but I didn't really know very much about them. Um, I went into LinkedIn. I set up um, alerts for those companies and for the, the titles that I wanted to, you know, look for. Um, I still do this to this day. Like if I'm, if I'm kind of casually looking around or if I'm looking for something else, like I'll still do this same thing. And like LinkedIn will, will let you set up alerts and things like that. Hitmaker is a good one. Um, so there's definitely places where you can go uh, to just start making, you know, your kind of wish list. Uh, the other th other kinds of lists I would make uh, for graduation is a list of your skills as well. Um, your resume is one way to be able to portray what exactly you're good at and what you're kind of lacking in. Um, but having a very distinct awareness yourself of what you are good at and what you are not so good at, um, you can be pretty blunt on paper in your own checklist. Um, I would also compare that checklist to job postings that you're seeing. So if you see I want this kind of tooling. I want this kind of software. I want uh, this kind of methodology. If you haven't used those tools, that software, that methodology, put it on your list of things that you need to learn um, because it's likely that you're going to need that at some point down the road. And so you can use that as almost like your checklist for you know, what you're going to level up in. Um, and so having an awareness of your strengths, your weaknesses, um, having an awareness of where you want to live, what you have, you know, where you have the means to go, um, make a list of the people that you know in your industry that are either out there working or have friends who are out there working. Um, it's lists. Everything is lists. Everything in the world is lists, <laughs> at least to me. This is like that Tootsie Roll commercial. <laughs> Every, wow. I, Everywhere I go, I'll see his tootsie rolls. It's lists. Everything is lists. So the, seriously, it is that the whole world can be broken down into a series of lists. And then uh, and that's how I approach uh, all of my projects. So. I love it. What <laughs> great advice. Thank you so much for this very valuable hour. I can't wait to grab the video when it's available and rewatch it. Um, and I will uh, do my best to get those forms you're going to share out to the people who would like them. Uh, if you want to, I guess, email me at kgreen at full sale. Dot com if you would like um, a copy of those templates so that I can make sure to, to relate those on to you. I'd be happy to. Thank you again, guys, and, and hope you enjoy the rest of the day and check out the other sessions this week. Hit me up on LinkedIn if you have more questions too. Happy to talk.